is, is that the universe really is just a giant cellular automaton. Um, and, you know, it's just cranking out these rules, very similar to the game of life. Yeah, um, and I, I can segue very nicely from that into the next thing, which is waves. Now, cellular automata can do waves. And keep in mind that quantum, quantum mechanics is basically wave mechanics. Is that right, Justin? In a lot of ways, yeah. More or less? And the interaction of, of particles can sort of be reduced to, to waves, and standing waves, in a sense. So well, let's take a look at this program and, and imagine monkeys typing on a keyboard. What's the probability that a monkey will, um, will, will type this exact configuration of, of symbols? Uh, but it's a lot more likely than a monkey writing like Shakespeare or something. I mean, let's look at a... Uh, is this the right one? Let's look at this rule. This is really all that we need. This rule right here. So let's look at the rule first. And I'm going to ask you guys to try to predict what's going to happen. So in this situation, each cell has a height, but it also has a velocity, a speed. So you think of it in 3D. The height is the, the direction this way or that way, and the velocity of, is the speed at which it's traveling. So look at this rule. Um, and the neighborhood sum is the sum of the uh, heights. Uh, yeah, the sum of the heights minus my height. So the neighborhood sum is the sum of the differences between my height and the cells around me. So yeah, for each cell in the neighborhood, the neighborhood sum plus equals, so that means add this to the neighborhood sum. My height, uh, well, the cell height for each cell around me minus my height. So if we're the same height, then it's going to be 0. Like if, if, if all the cells are the same height, then it's going to be 0. But th if there's difference, it's going to be the, the, the sum of the differences. And then my velocity uh, is increased by the neighborhood sum divided by 8, so the average of the neighborhood. So w what does this mean? What, what is this going to do? Does anybody tell me? Everybody around you is like very like varied. You, you may have like a higher one, but everybody is like the same. You have like a very low velocity. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. If if you're if if you're very different than the the ones the people around you, then your velocity is going to be higher. Right. So let's let's run it and see what happens. So, it's a wave, right? It's water. <laughs> so it's, it's fundamentally a wave. And since all particles are, are waves, it's, I mean, it's, it's something to, to consider that the universe may just be a giant computer. <laughs> so I added mouse clicks to this so we can actually click on it. So if I click on, like, the side, uh, hopefully it'll work. What's going on? There we go. <laughs> Look in the middle. You have things going on and off, on and off, on and off. Hmm? It's like a checkerboard. Yeah, it's like a checkerboard, sort of. So we don't need all that calculus anymore. Well, actually, what calculus is doing is approximating exactly this. Or, or the other way around. This is approximating the calculus. <laughs> calculus. It has even more detail than the so you say, like right? So he's saying if you have more pixels and and more resolution between the possible numbers that you can have, then you're going to approach actual physical reality, right? Yeah, you're right. But this is the fundamental limitation of computers; they're discrete. So I mean, there's only a finite number of possible heights for each cell, and there's only a finite number of possible cells that we can have. But the universe itself is discrete. How's the, how's the universe itself discrete? I mean. Time is discrete. Space is discrete. And you have to find plane and everything. So it has to be discrete. It can't be like continuous. Because that means within you have like as much matter as in the whole thing. Because 
Well, I mean, I, 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 the way I understand it is the universe is continuous because take take into account, I think, Zeno's paradox, right? No, yeah, but Zeno's paradox that doesn't make sense. It only makes sense when you hear it and say, okay, when I work from here to there, I'm adding up all these small values of these right. things that I, uh, I add up like, in a certain amount of time. So I am moving because mm -hmm. it's not continuous, it's discrete. Well, Z what Zeno said is to get from here to here, whoops, I have to first go halfway, and then halfway, halfway. The bottom is not to go like a single value. But it does not bottom out. It goes on inf infinitely. Yeah, but that's on a line. We don't have lines in there. Well, see, I mean, fr from here to there, it's a line. And it so, so fundamentally, the idea is, can we continue dividing matter? Like, infinitely maybe, small. Maybe you can stop a quartz atoms and... Right. I mean, that's the question, right? Like, are strings the bottom level, right? right. We're talking in terms of string theory. But what about space, though? But I mean, space s itself, like, space. Really I mean, it's just like locations. You, know? you don't have, like, a big, you know, you can, like, imagine, like, a big uh, Euclidean thing with, like, all the dots and everything. So yeah. you, you don't see that. It's just, like, a way of, like, showing, like, locations and everything. So you're saying there's a there's a, a fundamental the smallest distance yes. possible I or the right. So, but then. Here's the question. In our Euclidean plane, which is the universe, in this dot, which is an atom, 